Good evening, you're watching Estuary TV News. Coming up, you don't have to be mad to work here. Mental health in the workplace. A ceremonial opening of new facilities at St Andrew's Hospice in Grimsby. And I'll be talking to Richard Morris about the weekend's news stories. Welcome to Estuary TV News. I'm Hugh Riches. First of all, it's over to James Dunn for the news headlines. A 21-year-old man remains in hospital after sustaining a serious head injury in a mass brawl in Grimsby Town Centre. Police say his conditions are no longer a cause for concern after the fight on Saturday night outside Eden Bar on Bethlehem Street. Two 25-year-old men have been arrested and released on bail, but police are wanting to talk to a third. Four masked men robbed a convenience store in Grimsby's Wellington Street last night. They pushed one employee to the floor and made off with a large amount of money and coins at around 6.40pm. The men all wore scarves over their faces and police are appealing for witnesses. Now we all lost an hour at the weekend but Scunthorpe's famous clock tower remains frozen in time because of 40,000 40, tiny people. Around 3,000 people have been to the 2021 Visual Arts Centre to see Anthony Gormley's Turner Prize winning field for the British Isles since it opened earlier this month. But the 40,000 terracotta figures in the church nave means it's impossible to access the clock tower and move the clocks forward. So the clock will be an hour behind until the installation is removed on June the 27th. Now it's been 20 years in the planning but finally St Andrew's Hospice new building has been opened. The 12 bedroom facility has been designed to meet patients needs and embrace modern technology. Fundraising is now well underway to phase two which will see a well-being centre being constructed and which will offer patients the use of a jacuzzi and a gym. Alison Carlyle, chief executive, is delighted that after all this time the building has opened and it's now fit for purpose. In the bedrooms we've got hoists now, we've got controls so they can control the lighting, can control the TV, so it's about giving them their independence and dignity. The other thing is this great big space here, we're looking at day therapy being in the community hub. It's a bit trial and error to start with because it's, it, we're looking at a different model but this building gives us so many opportunities. Also we've got, uh, we'll be able to hold outpatient appointments here, we've got therapy rooms and then when we get to the health and wellbeing which is in phase two, which by the end of the year, that's going to have like a spa feel. So we've got time for in the bulletin today, but don't forget if you want to get in touch you can call us at 01472 31553. I'll see you tomorrow, but until then it's bye for now from me. Before Christmas, we featured a charity football match to celebrate 100 years since a Christmas truce during the First World War. Gavin Felt was the organiser who raised hundreds of pounds for charity, but now he's taking on a significantly tougher task to raise awareness of mental health in the workplace. Dave Nunn takes up the story. East Yorkshire fundraiser Gavin Felt is set to ride from Paris to London in under 24 hours to raise money for the Hull and East Yorkshire branch of the mental health charity Mind. Last year my brother uh, committed suicide, um, he was suffering from depression um, and I wanted to do something that would push both my mind and my body. Um, every year I do a charity event and this year I wanted to do something really different. Um, Hull and East Yorkshire Mind are a local company, uh, a local charity, sorry. Um, they've just had the funding cut and they still manage to help 2,000 people each year who suffer from mental illness. And Gavin is under no illusions how tough the task will be. He's been training for months to make sure he's ready. Um, well, basically, we've been training uh, since before Christmas. Uh, so when it's been snowing and ice and everything, wind, rain, uh, we've been out uh, pedalling. Um, so, yeah, and that's the preparation for trying to get to Paris in under 24 hours. Mind are a charity that help people overcome mental illness, a cause close to Gavin's heart. They appreciate the efforts of their fundraisers. It's a fantastic fundraising activity that Gavin's undertaking. Not only is it going to raise a significant amount of money for the charity, and for one of the smaller charities like us, you can really see the difference that money makes. You can almost track the money through to see the direct impact it has on those individuals we're helping. Uh, but the wonderful thing about Gavin's activity is the publicity it brings us to. I guess like all charities, uh, and often health charities too, uh, funding is a huge issue for us. Uh, we faced our share of cuts over the last few years. What we're incredibly grateful for is the support from the public that we've had out there, uh, for the donations that we receive, the fundraising campaigns that people set up on their own behalf, uh, come and tell us about it afterwards. 
if it wasn't for that level of support, we wouldn't be able to do the work that we do today. And Gavin is looking for fundraising of his own to make sure he can complete his epic challenge. He's contacted over 100 local companies asking for their support, but has been disappointed with the response. So far, I've contacted over 100 companies in the whole area. Um, I've so far managed to attract 11 sponsors, 11 definite sponsors. Yeah, it's a bit disheartening when, when you think that since Christmas, um, I've been out on my bike most weekends. You know, I mean, I'm putting in the legwork, um, you know, and it would be nice if a lot more local companies, both north and south of the bank, um, east or west of Hull, um, you know, would join in. You know, I mean, 100 companies is not unachievable. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it is disheartening, but I will do it. You're watching SGTV News. A little later, new buildings at St Andrew's Hospice in Grimsby. And James Dunn will be back to bring you all the sports news. Richard Morris is coming to sum up some of the weekend's news stories. Richard, what have you found? Uh, found some very, very interesting stuff that, uh, this weekend. Um, the Scunthorpe Telegraph are reporting that Arabian Royals are buying racing falcons from a £1 million North Lincolnshire business. Racing falcons? Now, now, doesn't that just pique your interest just to begin with? That is just a fantastic, um, that's just a fantastic headline. A wonderful sport, isn't um, it? Yeah, um, Bryn Close, he's opening a brand new £1 million facility in North Lincolnshire. Um, it, this is a man who, he's been, breeding, he's been breeding falcons 15 years. Apparently, he's you know been shipping them out there for you know basically that length of time, um, and apparently it's sort of twelve to fourteen weeks. He has the claim to fame that he can breed the fastest falcons in the world. How do you race falcons? Because I'm not entirely sure how you make them all go in a straight I, line or in the same direction. Oh, I, I presume it's just training. I presume it's just hours and hours and hours of training. But it's you know it, it, one of the more interesting. There's a number of very interesting quotes in this. Over here, I'm Joe Bloggs, but over there, they have me on a pedestal. Apparently, right. he's, he's, he's held in that high regard. Um, so he's going to, um, he's, he's currently breeding exclusively for the Crown Prince of Dubai. So that's how seriously this is taken. Okay. Um, and also there's, there's a few other fantastic quotes. This has turned into a passion and I'm not obsessed with it. I sold my house for £600,000 and spent all the money on falcons. Ah. Right. Well, so, clearly he's making his money back. Yep, indeed he is. Very um, popular sport of course, falconry go. hawking out in the Middle East, isn't it? Indeed, indeed. Um, a Scunthorpe granny has joined the anti-fracking camp. Now, of course, this could be seen to the side of the A180, and it's been there you know, for maybe a year now. Uh, but perhaps, this is also reported by the Scunthorpe Telegraph, perhaps the bigger story here is that actually they're saying that you know, it's actually, they haven't found anything. They were expecting to find 2.9 million um, barrels of oil underneath there. They haven't found anything. So basically the site is going to be closed. There up. is no oil in them, there are hills. In indeed not. <laughs> I don't know what the quote that and was the, from. And the, gr and the granny and the granny's joined to, uh, well, probably rather pointless protest now, I think. Well, well I mean, she's, she's joined in at the end. She's joined in at the end. Um, and she said that, that, you know, spending the time at the protest camp had been an eye-opener. Apparently everyone was great and they were all kind of like working, cooperating together. So it was a, a okay. And they, and well, that, Richard, thank you very much for thank coming. Thank you very here. much. With a capacity of 90,000, Wembley Stadium hosts some of the biggest matches in the football club calendar. Usually it's multi-million pound teams with millions of fans or the England football team who played there on Friday. But yesterday it was North Ferriby United playing at the iconic ground. The village wouldn't have filled the stadium even if all 4,000 residents made the trip. But being such a small club, victory meant all the more to the fans. And Tom Reid was there. Real good, real good atmosphere. You know. Great experience to see like yeah. everyone, from all the Ferriby fans out. I've got to say, for a village team, a village team to be playing at Wembley, you know, and the population of Ferriby as well, and the size of Ferriby, and where they've come in the last 10 years as a team, ridiculous, unbelievable. Well, I've come because the goalkeeper for Ferriby is at the gym where I go swimming on a Friday night, and we promised him if he ever got to Wembley, we'd be stuck behind that goal supporting him. Uh, I'm to win. I want to win. Hopefully my lad's going to start, so fingers crossed. Yeah, he plays for Ferriby, hopefully. Hopefully, we don't know the team, but yeah, he's, uh, he's on loan from Hull City, so uh, he's been there about 10 games. He's just, just been, just sort of joined at a really good time. It's like just mind blowing, and it's really exciting to just be here. Not, uh, I'm just amazed, not even like at the ground, just like outside as well. A really good game, I hope, I hope they win obviously, but I'd love it to go to penalties. 
Love it. <laughs> Tom Reed was there then and is here now. Tom. Hello, Hugh. It did go to penalties in the end. Yes, it's everything you could have really asked for for a cup final, except a red card, which you don't want to see all the time. But yeah, it had five goals, extra time, and penalties, everything you want. Very, very exciting afternoon. <laughs> How did the North Ferryby fans react to triumph? As you can imagine. I don't think many of them expected to go there and win. A lot of them told me they were just going, you know, it's a great day out, what an occasion. They wanted to be part of that. The win would be the bonus. So, of course, they went absolutely mad, um, and rightly so. You know, they deserve to celebrate that way. We, we were, we, we were, I'm al already, I'm partisan. Uh, North Ferriby were the underdogs, weren't they, very much? They was, yeah, very much so. Obviously, Wrexham in the league above, not doing so great in that league, but on paper, you know, Wrexham full-time footballers, uh, you know, they do this week in, week out. You know, Ferriby probably train two or three times a week. They've got other part-time jobs. Uh, it was a dodgy first half, though, wasn't it? The, the, the first few minutes, the first couple of goals went Wrexham's way. Well, I think, yeah, the first half, you sort of thought, you know, this is the way everyone thought it was going to go. Wrexham, very dominant in the first half, obviously got the goal, and then you think, it's only going to go one way now. Um, you know, they came out in the second half, Wrexham got another goal, and I think Ferriby woke up at that point, or they just thought, you know what, the pressure's off now, we've got nothing to lose. So just get out there and enjoy yourself. Yeah, yeah, enjoy the occasion. And there are a couple of moments, a couple of the Ferriby goals were, were beauties. Yes, I have to say, they were, they were very good standard as well. They were, you know, they were league quality goals. Uh, their, their winger, Jason St. Just, was, was creating a lot of things. And, you know, he's a quality player. And I think he missed the opportunity, Jason St. Just, to be uh, playing internationally for his country. That's correct, yes. He was, he was asked to play for his country the same weekend, Ferriby. Uh, you know, this weekend just gone, uh, yeah, to play for his country, but he said, no, I'm, I'm going to play for my club. His country being, I think, the Turks and Caicos Islands. Uh, St. Kitts and Nevis. Kitts and Nevis, yes. your bone. Sorry, I'm, my, my cricketing knowledge is uh, interfering <laughs> okay. there. Uh, so, that, they went to penalties. What do you think of that? Is that a, is that a good way to end a football match? It's, it, you'd rather win it in uh, the 90 minutes, I would imagine, because, uh, you know, obviously penalties, it's a lottery, really. But again, you don't win penalties and think we don't deserve to win this. You still deserve to win it, and obviously the goalkeeper, the hero in that. Yes, absolutely, and it was. It was a heroic uh, effort. It, it does all come down to one man, doesn't it? Well, that's the thing. You know, the pressure is on the goalkeeper, really. I, well, I don't think the goalkeeper's expected to save it, but they're under immense pressure. So yep. when they make that save, you know, they're the hero. So what was the atmosphere like in the stands? You had, I think there are about 3,000 people from North Ferriby there. Yes, the, the total attendance of the game was 14,585. So just over 14,500. And, um, but then the, the Wrexham fans massively outnumbering the North Ferriby. Massively, Ferry. yeah. Uh, you know, they're, obviously they're a bigger club. Uh, they've got a bigger population in the city of Wrexham. So, you know, as you expect, more fans, but great atmosphere from both sets of fans. Still, still a little bit uh, empty, isn't it? Only fourteen thousand people in a ninety thousand yeah. person stadium. Yeah. Obviously, there was many, many empty seats, but yeah. don't take you know take nothing away from it. It was still a great atmosphere. Absolutely, absolutely. Afterwards, was there a certain amount of Celebration, a certain amount of cheering, a certain yes. amount of drink consumed. Yeah, they have the you know the ritual of the old champagne, shaking that uh, team photo behind an FA Trophy winners banner. You know they went up to the top in front of the royal box and lifted the trophy. Oh, what what a thing for these players to do! Absolutely fantastic. Was it who was who was handing over the trophy? Just some the FA. Of, official from the FA, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Okay, and uh, well, what do you think about the chances of the same thing happening next year? <sighs> never say never. But what's happened this season? You think Maybe it's a matter of it. Well, let's talk about the future in a bit. But first of all, we're just going to have to go over to, uh, to another story, Tom. Thanks very much. No problem. Uh, the Great and the Good were invited yesterday to witness the official opening of a new state-of-the-art hospice facility in Grimsby. St Andrew's Hospice was founded in 1981 when it operated from the Molson Centre in the town. Twenty years ago, it moved to its present site. And since then, they've been preparing for this new building. Among the guests were many long-term supporters and fundraisers. Emma Lingard went along. This was the moment when St Andrew's Hospice's new £5.5 million building was officially opened by long-term supporters George Kavanagh and Belinda Watson. Belinda's son Glenn used the hospice 15 years ago and she's supported it ever since. As amazing as this building is, we still have to come back to the true fact of what this building really is. And it is a place that people, you know, are at end of life and it is tough. Um, but this place is something else. It can just help you through all of that process. The, the staff are amazing. 
and the kindness, the dignity, everything that they give you here, the support, the emotional support, they're not just offer you um, and the patients, it's the whole family, the, it's a whole package deal that you know you can't get anywhere else and you can have a fabulous building but it's the people in it that make it and some of the people here are amazing. Among the guests here to see the new 12-bed facility was professional dancer Joanne Clifton from Strictly. Visiting with her father Keith, the hospice's latest ambassador was looking forward to her role, assisted by George. Oh, George is wonderful. George shows me around, he tells me everything. He even, um, he signed because there's the... Le uh, the leaflets with this photo on it and I asked him for an autograph but he's like you can only have an autograph if you pay one pound okay so it's actually one pound fifty so one pound it's yeah. gone up it's gone up yeah. one pound fifty okay and we put all that money into the hospital so give me five well done the facility has been purpose built to suit users needs and will be followed in phase two by a well-being centre well, the one thing our patients told us, they didn't want to be in a, a multi-bedded um, ward, but they felt quite isolated sometimes in a single room. So what we've done now is the bedrooms have a glass wall onto the corridor, so patients can see people coming and going if they wish. If not, there's an integrated blind there, so it, it goes to a, a normal wall. So hopefully by that, we'll, we'll, you know, the patients can join in what's going around on around them. Um, within the bedrooms we've got hoists now, we've got controls so they can control the lighting, can control the TV, so it's about giving them their independence and dignity. Tom Reed is still with me. Tom, 3,000 North Ferriby fans in Wembley yesterday, the town must have been empty. Yeah, I think that's about 80% of, and I'm not very good at maths, but that's a lot of the, uh, the village that went, yeah. Well, it's three, three quarters of the population. Yeah, yeah, yeah so it felt empty. Uh, uh, where are all the fans from North Ferriby, or do they have a, a following from elsewhere in the country? Now, we spoke to some fans before the game, as you'll see uh, you know, this weekend on, on Extra. Uh, a lot of fans came from Hull as well. Uh, it's either their second club, or you know, they support Ferriby from Hull. And maybe after this result, they'll have fans across the world. Well, yeah, I must mention well, their Twitter followers, their fan base shot up on Twitter during this game and afterwards. So, you know, they've got a bit of exposure there, yeah. OK. You mentioned on the bench, how are you going to be covering it? Uh, we'll say we, we spoke to the fans about the occasion and what it means to them. So we're going to be hearing more from those fans and we're going to get reaction from Twitter as well. OK. There is a significant money consequence to winning this trophy. Yes. Uh, how much does North Ferriby get? £50,000 for winning this competition. So for a club of Ferriby's size, that's a significant amount of cash. Uh, and any, do they have any particular plans for it? I don't know as yet. We know we're going to speak to the club through, through the coming week. Um, but I, I imagine they've never had that kind of money before at the, at the level they play at. So this is a massive sort of thing for this club. Um, then what, there might be some new stands at the ground or something like that? Yeah, may investment in more players, uh, yes. you know, investment in facilities, training grounds, things like that. It would be a bit of a pity if they invest in more players there because the whole charm of North Ferriby is that they're an amateur or a semi-professional amateur side. If you start spending money on players, then you're just buying yourself goals, aren't you, really? Yeah, I mean, they can Im obviously they are part-time footballers, so it's not going to be like we see in the Premier League, you know, splashing out big amounts of cash, but it might be a case of increasing numbers. Yeah. Um, so, you know, rather than having a playing squad of 15, they might increase that to 20. So they've got more chance to compete at, at their level. And they're still competing. Their season is not over. No, far from it, Hugh. Um, you know, we're talking off air. They're, they're still on for the playoffs. That's not impossible. So this win might spur them on to go and get that. And uh, when would we know? When are those, what, what games lie ahead? Uh, at the end of the season, uh, around May time. So, you know, there's, there's still games left for Ferriby to make those playoff places. And, of course, they were there last season. So it's not beyond them to do that, and they, they could be joining Grimsby Town next season. What about in, in our area, in our broadcast area, what other teams have been um, performing well down in the lower leagues, down in the lower parts of the game? There's not too many in our area that play at that level. Um, obviously, you've got the likes of Clee Town and Brig Town. Those clubs, at their level, they're playing really well. Um, but North Ferriby, I think they're the, the standout heroes at the moment. You know, they're doing the area proud. And you say maybe they could be competing against Grimsby Town, for instance, in, in, the, in the next seasons coming up. Come on, who would win? Grimsby Town, North Ferriby? Well, if Grimsby Town don't get promoted, that is, um, you know, it, it would be a tight game. Because, of course, Grimsby Town featured in the same fixture against Wrexham two years ago, and they failed to beat Wrexham in this same fixture. North Ferriby obviously beat Wrexham at the weekend, so if you look at, look at it that way, it would be an even game. There's a tense relationship there, isn't there? Yeah. Just, you mentioned that Grimsby Town might be going up. What's, uh, what's going on there? They're a point of top spots. 
um, which for Mariners fans is very exciting. This is the closest they've been for five seasons, uh, getting back into league football. So huge support this weekend for the Mariners. They've sold over 2,000 tickets for their away game, which again, at this level, is incredible. And uh, just remind me, which, which division, which league are they in at the moment? Grimsby Town. Yep. They're the Vanarama Conference. And they're competing to get into? The League Two, back into the Football League. And that would mean, again, uh, more money, presumably? Of course, yeah. Financial reward, uh, high AU play. Uh, and uh, will possibility of our televising them sometimes? Yes, of course, yeah. I mean, they're televised at the moment in the league they're in. Um, but, you know, get back into League Football, there's, yeah, more chance of that, of course. OK, well then, with good luck to them. Congratulations to North Ferriby. I th suspect that the celebrations are still continuing over I there. would imagine so, yes. All right, Tom, thank you very much for no coming. No problem. In. Now, here's the sport with James Dunn again. North Ferriby United have won the FA Cup trophy at Wembley Stadium in a dramatic penalty shootout. The Villagers went 2-0 down against Wrexham but bounced back and at one point were leading their higher league opponents three goals to two. But Wrexham got one back and after extra time the game went to penalties. After five attempts they were still neck and neck forcing the teams into sudden death but then Nathan Peake put them 5-4 ahead before goalkeeper Adam Nicklin made his third penalty save and the celebrations began. In League One, Scunthorpe United's Niall Canavan scored an 86th minute equaliser for the Iron in a 2-2 draw at Notts County. They're now just one point above the relegation zone. Grimsby Town continued their promotion push in the Conference Premier with a 2-0 win at Welling United. Ollie Palmer and Sean Pearson netted in the first half, putting them just one point behind league leaders Barnet. In Super League, Hull FC lost 20 points to 14 away at Castleford Tigers. Meanwhile, at Craven Park, Hull KR beat St Helens in a tight match ending 24-22. In ice hockey, Hull Stingrays beat Brayhead Clan 5-4 on aggregate in the playoffs, bouncing back from a 3-2 deficit on Saturday evening. They'll now face the Sheffield Steelers in the playoff semi-final at Nottingham this Saturday. Finally, in National Midlands League 2, Hull Ionians beat Luptonians 28-0. They're now three points clear at the top after nearest rivals Amps Hill and District suffered an unexpected 14-45 defeat at home to Lowly Hull. In League 3, Scunthorpe beat Bourneville 25-22. That's all for the sport. Thanks, James. Tom, just remind us, when can we watch On The Bench Extra? This Saturday, 10am, on Ashley TV, of course, and we'll be talking about that final in more depth. Saturday, 10am, on right. the bench for the, for the cup final. Yeah. That's all we have time for. If you have a story for us, please go to our Facebook or Twitter pages. Details on the screen. Email news at estuary.tv or phone Grimsby 31553. Until tomorrow, good evening. Hello there and welcome to Estuary TV's weather. A cold Tuesday with strong winds and showers. Some bright spells are likely between showers and a maximum temperature of 8 degrees Celsius. Wednesday we'll see some cold with occasional showers and winds easing overnight. 